Good morning, creators, and welcome to the final video of the Verse Persistence series so far. If you haven't seen the previous two episodes, please go see those before you watch this. But this is a very exciting video. It's the first time I've gotten to showcase some of Underwater Labs code. And I think this is a very good framework for persistence that you may get inspired by uh, or just blatantly copy. I wouldn't mind. It's a good system, and I hope that people start implementing things like this that are going to be much more user friendly. So here we are in Underwater Labs, the official UFN map in all of its glory. Uh, we're going to open up Verse, and I'm going to show you exactly how I implemented persistence in Underwater Labs. Now, it's some of this is a relic because I did run into an issue when I was publishing uh, for a thumbnail. Um, I did not, I left some uh, just residual, you know, data in here that I couldn't delete because I already published. Um, so watch episode two of this series, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, so, you know, Underwater Labs was really a case study, like the first time I've done persistence, I ran into all these issues, um, but it's stabilized and it works now. Um, so up top, I has I have two persistent data maps you're allowed to uh when you're publishing uh each of these can be up to 128 kilobytes which is a lot of data frankly data that you'll never run out of if you run out of that data i'd be very impressed or very disappointed um because anybody who's efficient with data should not really run into that um with a with a map that usually runs into a memory issue before you run into a data issue it's simple simple framework here you do the is active check, um, you get their data. So I have a legacy profile map. This stores like the lifetime values. So these are never like, you never subtract from these values. So if you wanna store the number of sand dollars they've collected over their lifetime, that's what the legacy profile is for. The player profile is for the current values that they're gonna have. And so you can see my, uh, my constructor here. There's a lot, I have something called my show numerals. It's just like an exponential value. Um, it, it's what lets me climb into extremely large numbers without storing a lot of data. Um, you have integers, you have floats, you have miscellaneous, uh, which are like classes usually, uh, and then deprecated or anything that I, I'm not using that um, I unfortunately published with and have to deal with. So in here, we have our legacy profile data class. Uh, I have a map that stores um, my numerals with an ID, so the ID is like zero through six or seven, uh, and it maps to a value. So I think zero is sand dollars, one is trash, two is recycle points, something like that. And this is the value associated with that currency. The fishy map is the index here, is the index relating to the fish. The fish map is another one of these where it's an integer that is associated to the rarity of the fish. And then we have a maestro numeral for the amount of fish caught. And so that's kind of what I've done with those. Um, I also have similar values down here. Uh, also redeemed codes. Um, so I can I can check to see um, which codes in the pin pad device they've put in. Um, so quite a bit here. And then I have the player profile data. Similar structure, um, but a few differences. Like I have a version number and what the version number does, it allows me to uh, recognize what version the player is in. So if I want to update data, then I can update that. And I believe I have a folder for that somewhere. Um, updates, yeah. Updates. So when the player joins the game, um, I call the apply update function. So it's going to get the le legacy data and it's going to get the profile data. Now, both of these functions will create the data if the player doesn't have it already. Um, so that's why I call both, even though I only really need to get the version number. Um, this is going to ensure that these um, that this data is set for the player. So if the player's current version is greater than or equal to current version, which is just an integer I have in this folder, um, the current version is six. When I add something that I need to change, I'm going to increment this to seven or eight or nine or 10, just to tell the, the players when they join after I've updated that their data needs to change because I've made some change to the game that requires their data to change. Um, so let's take a look, take a look at one of those versions. Uh, version one, 
uh, I needed to fix the rebirth system. So I basically went through all of the uh, the rebirth data and I had to reset some of it. Um, I had to return their pearls so they could claim those things. Um, and so that that's what I had to do there. Um, two versions, somebody wasn't able to reroll their rebirth stats, so I gave them a free one here. Um, and then at the end, every time at the end, I make sure to set the profile data with the uh, the current version. So there's a for loop up top that goes from their current version to the actual current version. So the update current version. Um, so the player's version to the current version. And it applies all of these updates. And then at the end, it makes sure that their profile data has the current version, uh, the actual current version, um, so that it knows not to update this to the next time they join. And then uh, I, I go ahead and call the patch notes menu so that the player can uh, see that what changed. So that's that. Uh, let me go back up to persistence. A lot of verse here. You can see on the side, you can see kind of see what I was implementing in, uh, in this project. Um, player profile. So yeah, same thing. Set profile data. data. We check to see if they're active. Um, if, they're, if they are, then we can ignore that and we can set their profile data. Get profile data is going to create their, uh, their profile data. And uh, I go ahead and set their current version to the current version here because obviously if they're a new player, then they have the latest version of data. Uh, we don't need to worry about that. And then check save data for players, something I call it the game start. Uh, and basically just this is, um, this is going to uh, apply the update when they, um, when they need. So, and, and there's a bunch of other things down here, like setting and getting fish and uh, currencies, and that just helps uh, reduce the, the workload when I'm working with um, just kind of layered data there. Now, I have another folder here called persistence, and I think this is going to be a valuable one. This is going to show you how I, um, how I deal with data. I think you might have caught a glimpse of that when you're looking through my code. So let's take a look at integers, how I handle integers. Um, this is basically what I use for all my values. Um, so I have a get legacy int uh, function, and I have a set for that as well. Then I have a getter and setter for the profile data ints. And so what this is is um, I have an ID associated with the value that I want to get. So like for um, for currencies. Um, Basically, I'll divide this integer or this um, this ID by uh, underscores. So this uh, get IDs function is going to get each of those like sub IDs. It's like a domain system. When I want to change their their levels for their phishing, um, phishing is the domain there. The second domain is what the what the stat is. And so what this is going to do is find that and just return that value. And then of course, if it's nothing. It's going to go to um, basically. It's going to return all these values, and if it fails to return any of those values, it's going to get the legacy int, and it's going to go through all the get legacy ints. And if it doesn't find a integer for that stat, then it's just going to return nothing. The reason why I have two functions is because my legacy values often overlap with the profile values. Like uh, if I were storing currencies. Those overlap because they have the same ID, um, the exact same ID, by the way. Um, so when I want to get a legacy sand dollars versus the current sand dollars, I can call this specific function rather than um, rather than this, um, rather than um, you know calling it all all at once. But um, I think that's a good system for me. Um, yeah. So I mean, this this seems really complicated, but it, it's essentially just um, taking the ID and breaking it up to what the uh, the system identifies. Uh, it's going to use a case statement to map the first domain to uh, whatever set of actions I want to do. Uh, and then there I might have another case statement that checks the next domain. Um, I might have a sub function that does the next thing. Um, but like it'll set data where I want it to. Go ahead and copy the data, um, and I, it's obviously super complicated. I can't I can't explain it too well, 
Um, but it's more just there as an example of um, what looks like a monster is actually really, really convenient. Um, and down here is kind of the cool thing. Um, I have a plus and minus function. And so what this is do doing is it's going to take the player. It's going to take the stat, which is going to be a string re representing the ID and then an integer representing the value you want to add. And the same thing with the subtract. And basically it's going to set the integer equal to their current value plus that value or that current value minus that current value or minus that, that value. So if I wanted to test this out um, with, with a player, and this is where it's really, really beautiful. Um, I can just do something like player plus um, and then parentheses because it's a tuple. Uh, we'll do a we'll do areas unlocked as the ID. Unlocked and then one. And what this is going to do is literally just add one value to their areas unlocked. So instead of going um, instead of getting their save data. Um, the alternative to this is player dot get um, profile data. Maybe it's legacy data. I don't remember. I think it's legacy data. The alternative is that. And then we have to create a new one. So new LD is equal to legacy profile data. And then we're going to have make legacy profile data constructor LD. And then um, LD dot um, or uh, it would be uh, areas unlocked is ld dot areas unlocked plus one and then we have to set the player data so player dot set legacy data which is already extension function and we'll do new ld like that's a lot of code and not very replicable um it's just annoying to type that a million times instead this is just one line so easy to type so easy to deal with and i don't have to like find this i just use the id to find it so i could just have a function that has passes the id or passes the value so much simpler so much easier to work with i i hope i hope you can see the utility in this um so that's what the plus is for that's what the operator statement is for you can also do something like player dot get uh legacy int we'll do areas unlocked And so we'll just throw that into like AU and boom, you've got it. That's it right there. That's, that's all you have to do. You've gotten your value. Uh, otherwise, you know, if you explicitly know what to do, like player dot get legacy data dot areas unlocked is not too difficult to do, but when you have like hundreds of items in your game um it's far easier to just use an id system like this um, because it breaks it up uh, you don't have to worry about knowing the exact name of things because your your function handles all of it for you um, now obviously the, the pitfall of this is you have to know the ids if you don't know the ids you're kind of screwed um, but that's based off of how you name things and um, breaking it up makes it a little bit easier to work with. So like if I wanted to get a specific fish, uh, let's say I want the, uh, rare tanks. I know that my naming system is player dot get my short numeral. Actually, I call, I think I call it get MN for short. Yeah. Um, and it's fishes is the main domain. Tang is the second domain. So fishes is just very broad, any kind of fish. The second one is the type of fish. And the third one is the rarity. And the rarity is consistent across all of them. And that's just rare. So boom, those are my rare tangs right there. So I hope you see that this is a very useful system for implement implementing uh, persistent data. Uh, when you are reaching like higher levels and higher counts of persistent data, it would be smart to implement a framework like this um, just to simplify things. Uh, it adds a lot of, you know, adds a lot of possibilities and reduces the amount of 
headaches you'll get because you don't have to type this monster every single time. You just do a single line. Um, it has a lot of utility. Um, and it's just, it's a great system. And it, it, it builds into the other systems I have in underwater labs. And, you know, that's, that's all I can really hope for. Um, I know, once again, it's kind of confusing. That's just underwater labs in a nutshell. Trust me, this is like a really good way to implement it. That makes it very digestible, um, easier to program, and gives you like less lines to to type in your use there. So, if you survive this video, please consider leaving a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Um, I hope you found this beneficial. This whole series, um, learning the basics and the quirks of the system, and uh, I hope this video in particular inspired you to develop your own frameworks, uh, not only for persistence for, but for other things as well. Um, but if you are working with persistence, feel free to copy this, um, feel free to build your own and share what you do. Um, tag me if you come up with a better system. Uh, it's always great to explore the opportunities, um, to, you know, learn something new and experiment. Um, so good luck with that. And I hope you enjoy your new persistence knowledge.